On the evening of September 11, 2001, after the world witnessed the tragic collapse of the World Trade Centers, a nearby building mysteriously collapsed, the WTC-7. How did this almost perfect-looking building collapse? The key to this mystery lies in this video footage. Did you notice a sharp V-shaped dent at the top of the building well before the main collapse? This was the penthouse of WTC-7. Exactly below this dent, you'll be able to observe the three main columns of the building. You can conclude that this dent happened simply because these three columns collapsed. The WTC-7 also had a perimeter tube design. 24 central core columns carried the main weight of the building. The core and perimeter tubes were connected using many horizontal girders. Unlike the other buildings, the WTC-7 had a penthouse, which carried heavy cooling equipment. Let's simplify the geometry of the girders for an easier to understand visual. You can see the penthouse of the building was structurally supported by the core columns. Here comes another twist. All 24 of these core columns do not extend all the way to the ground directly like this. When construction of the WTC-7 began, there was already an electrical substation on the site. Although the authorities didn't want to demolish this building, the location of the substation was interfering with some core columns. Exactly eight core columns. This gave rise to a rather clever idea. These eight interfering core columns were taken out horizontally to the substation and finally connected to the ground via these transfer trusses. By observing this visual, you'll get a clear idea about how the load of these eight trusses were transferred to the ground. This structural technique is known as transfer truss method. The issue's not over yet. Few perimeter columns of WTC-7 were also interfering with the substation. They were also connected to the ground via transfer trusses. Even though eight columns are not connected to the ground directly, these transfer trusses made sure that the central columns are still strong. Please keep the details of the structural connections in your mind. They'll play an important role in understanding the collapse of WTC-7. From the north side, this building looks intact. But let's turn the camera to the south side. This was the true condition of the building, enduring a huge fire with a big gash on the perimeter columns. This is real video footage of the World Trade Center Building 7 from the opposite angle. You can see clearly here that the fire in the building was spreading on a large scale. You can imagine the damage it must have caused in the building. The WTC-7 had fires on multiple floors, burning over several hours. Because firefighters were busy saving the lives of those in the collapsed WTC-1 and 2, they were unable to suppress the fire in this building. Did you notice a long gash on the south side of the building? How exactly did this happen? The only way the perimeter columns of WTC-7 create such a long and consistent gash is due to the fall of the spire from the North Tower. Look at this image, they're pretty close. Anyway, the south side of WTC-7 developed such a long breach of the perimeter columns. This is evident from this image. Here comes the most important stage of this video. Here's one famous photograph from the WT-7 debris. The I-shaped structure you see here are the girders of the building. Did you notice a strange 90 degree bent on them? How did this happen? The supporters of the control dimension theory has no answer for this strange bend. However, if you connect the dot logically, we will be able to solve this case. During the collapse, did you notice a kink at the top of the building? What's even more strange is the movement in the northeast corner of the building towards the left. How is such a wall movement possible? We don't see any such kink in this footage. What's going on here? In fact, this is a clear case of visual illusion. Take a look at the balcony of this apartment. Although you might believe that the balcony is bent downward, in reality, 
the balcony is bent inward, the camera angle causes such an illusion. Here also the top edge of the building didn't bend down, but bent inward. More precisely, during the collapse, the northeast corner of the building moved forward and a region in the north wall moved inward slightly. We'll learn the reason behind this strange inward wall movement very soon. When observing the deformation of this building from a bottom camera, we get the illusion of a kink at the top and the corner of the building moving towards the left. Now, let's review the entire sequence of the collapse to better understand how the girders bent heavily. The East Penthouse was added in the year 1989 to accommodate more cooling equipment. This is why the structural support of the East Penthouse looks slightly awkward. As we've seen previously, the weight of the East Penthouse was majorly carried by these three columns, the column numbers 79, 80, and 81. During the collapse of WTC 1 and 2, tons of debris entered the south side of this building. Over time, the temperature in the building's lower floors exceeded 600 degrees Celsius. Columns 79, 80, and 81 were already under huge stress due to the weight of the penthouse. With these steep increases in temperature, they eventually buckled, forming a V-shaped collapse on the penthouse. Once the core lost three columns, the remaining columns were under more stress. Remember, the next two sets of core columns are connected to the ground via transfer trusses. At the height of transfer trusses, the building temperature was quite high, and the transfer truss failed. This put the remaining columns into more stress, and the column collapse progressed. If you observe the collapse, you can see a small tilt to the top of the penthouse. This indicates that the core columns collapsed progressively. If the core columns had collapsed simultaneously, we would not have seen this small tilt. Let's turn our attention back to the second and third sets of core columns. The transfer truss is already broken. Can you predict the motion of the structures due to this failure? Without the transfer truss, the huge weight carried by columns 76 and 73 will make the horizontal girders bend. The perimeter columns 47 and 48 are directly connected with the horizontal girders. This means columns 47 and 48 have to bend inward during the building collapse. This is the reason one portion of the perimeter columns moved inward during the collapse, the same motion we observed in the real collapse footage. After all core columns collapse, will it be possible for the perimeter columns to bear the load of the whole building? Absolutely not. The perimeter tube alone is as weak as a cereal box. With a lengthy gash on the perimeter tubes at the south side of the WTC-7 building, it didn't fall perfectly down. Instead, it twisted, with the northeast region of the perimeter tube moving towards the camera. This twisted motion of the perimeter columns is the reason why the girders bent almost 90 degrees. In other words, the twisted girders provide more evidence for the twisted movement of the perimeter walls. The twisting of the building skeleton is once again clear from this footage. You can even observe that the other corner is twisting away from the camera. In short, the WTC-7 didn't drop straight down, but with a heavy twist of its perimeter tubes, the northeast corner moved towards the camera and the other moved away. Did the WTC-7 come down at freefall speed? No, it did not. If you analyze the original footage of the collapse, the top 18 floors came down in 5.4 seconds. This time period is 40% more than the freefall time, which is 3.9 seconds. Most of the re-uploaded videos on YouTube are uploaded after increasing the footage speed by exactly 40%. A nice trick to bring the building down at freefall speed. If you compare the WTC-7 collapse with WTC-1 and 2, you'll be able to see the stark difference in the physics of the collapse. In WTC-1 and 2, during the collapse you won't observe any motion in the bottom region of the building. It's a top-down, progressive collapse. However, 
In WTC7, without the core columns, the entire building went down together. In the location of WTC7, currently, you'll be able to see a taller building than this, the 7 World Trade Center. The previous electrical substation building is located inside the 7 WTC. The first 10 floors of this building is dedicated for the substation. The collapse of Twin Towers heavily damaged many more nearby buildings, WTC3, WTC4, WTC5, and even WTC6. And you know what happened to WTC7. All these buildings were damaged to such an extent that they had to completely demolish it. Some of these buildings were later reconstructed. Before I end this video, I would like to pay tribute to a man who taught me a lot about different structural movements of WTC7, Mr. Joe Hill. Joe Hill passed away around three months back after a long fight with cancer. The greatness of Joe Hill was that he never enforced his conclusions on me. Instead, he proved me logically, with help of photography and video evidence, what's the nature of WT7 collapse. And this man spent his last 15 years of his life studying and analyzing WT7 collapse, also writing about it. Mr. Joe Hill, I will always cherish the long email conversation with you. And thank you for all your support.